This is Tom Bernanke and today I'm talking about the new studies of vitamin K2. It's very important for a lot of health conditions, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, immune health, dental health. I'm gonna talk about how much to take, what to take it with, and we're starting now. So make sure you stick around towards the end. I'm gonna tell you everything you need to know about vitamin K and whether it's worth supplementing or not for you. Vitamin K is not the same as potassium, which is the elemental K. Potassium is an element and, and vitamin K is a fat soluble vitamin. Vitamin K is confusing enough, but it's not potassium. And the thing is, there's lots of different types of vitamin K. There's three types. We're going to focus mostly on vitamin K2, which is what shows the most benefits now, and this is what studies are focusing on. So whenever I say vitamin K, I'm usually focusing on vitamin K2 unless specified. So there are two types of vitamins. There's fat-soluble vitamins. Those are A, D, E, and K. One of the questions raised by low-fat diets are, are we getting enough of these A, D, E, and K vitamins now? Because if we cut out all the fat in our diet, we might be lacking these, and specifically vitamin K2 may be one of these. And the water-soluble vitamins are B, there's a lot of different Bs, basically one through 12, and then there's vitamin C. Vitamin K originated because in German it stood for coagulation with a K. And the thing is, vitamin K is essential for calcium storage in our body, and it only stays in our body for 24 hours as it's fat soluble. So we have to be getting vitamin K into our system every 24 hours somehow. Vitamin K works with osteoporosis, vascular calcification, osteoarthritis, cancer. And I'm gonna go into the studies that correlate this later in the video. So there's three types of vitamin K. There's K1, which is phyloquinone, K2, which is menaquinone, and K3, which is menadione. K the chemical compounds are fairly similar, but they do completely different things. So vitamin K2 is a lot different than vitamin K1. Specifically, K1 is more involved in blood clotting, whereas K2 is more involved in all of the benefits that we're focusing on in this video. And K2 is important to be comboed with vitamin D, and we'll talk about magnesium, and we'll talk about calcium. So this is going to be a juicy video. Specifically, studies with vitamin K2, MK7 have shown with bone health. There's specific studies showing that this vitamin helps with bone density in elderly people through its modulation of osteocalcin, which we'll talk about. It helps glucose, testosterone, muscle strength, cognition. So these are some pretty new studies. And the big one is K2 can let you absorb more calcium and more vitamin D with less of that calcium getting into your blood vessels. So this can have heart benefits. And specifically in older people, we see a lot of calcification in arteries. So this can prevent that. Vitamin K is essential to make blood clots. Blood clots are scary to people, but otherwise we'd bleed out every day if we didn't have vitamin K. Vitamin K is normally pretty easy to get in a healthy diet, but in the Western diet, of course, we're a little bit more susceptible to not getting vitamin K. This is the big secret of vitamin K that we'll talk about. Most people get enough of K1, but K2 can be severely lacking, and this is the one we want for all those good health benefits we'll talk about. I'll explain this more later, but vitamin K2 is essential for turning on matrix GLA protein and osteocalcin. This is what takes calcium out of your blood vessels and puts it into your bone and a few other effects. Vitamin K1 is responsible for your clotting cascade. So even though they have a similar name, they do very different things and they're available in very different bioavailabilities for these things. A slight variation in the chemical compound can lead to binding to different receptors and performing completely different functions in the body. Where people have malabsorption disorders are alcohol abuse. If you're drinking too much alcohol, you're not absorbing enough vitamin K. Liver, gallbladder, biliary issues. These could be drug interaction. Celiac disease and cystic fibrosis can cause a deficiency. Long-term antibiotics, dialysis. This lowers the diet intake and your gut bacteria. If you have a vitamin K deficiency, these signs include unusual bleeding or easy bruising. 
This is a prolonged prothrombin time, and we can test that in clinic. Hemorrhaging, so if you're bleeding all the time, and a lot. Osteopenia, that means weak bones. So vitamin K is needed to form blood clots in our body. It's very essential. This seems like a bad thing, but it's actually a really good thing. Otherwise, we'd bleed out all the time. It's also needed for bone function and stability. So what kind of dosage of vitamin K do we need per day? Well, in men per day, on average, we need 120 micrograms. For women, we need 90 micrograms. The good news is foods can get us a lot. So for example, collard greens give us one cup equals 1,000 micrograms. Kale, one cup equals 1,000 micrograms. Broccoli, one cup equals 220 micrograms. Spinach, one cup equals 810 micrograms. Brussels sprouts, one cup equals 220 micrograms. That alone is well over your daily need. So simply eating a little tiny amount of greens per day will get you your vitamin K amounts. K1 comes from those leafy greens. K2 comes from a food called natto, which is fermented beans, pork, sausage, egg yolk. So the difference is vitamin K2 MK7 is what we want because that's the most bioactive compound and that's what's studied. So all these benefits that we talk about, we're talking about vitamin K2 and the WHO and the FAO say we're only getting five to 25% of our daily value. So you can get it from these foods, but we'll also talk about this is where supplementation can make sense. Your GI tract can make some, but it's a small amount. So if you're not eating sauerkraut, natto, soy, or cheese every day in large amounts, this might make sense to supplement. So MK7 comes more from the fermented foods like natto and sauerkraut, and K2, MK4 comes more from the meats. But eggs should have it. The problem is the eggs don't because the eggs are now no longer fed meat because the chickens now eat grain instead of meat themselves. Well, the trick with the vitamin K is if you freeze foods with vitamin K, that actually destroys the vitamin K. So you don't want to freeze foods if you need vitamin K, but cooking foods does not actually show to decrease it or destroy it. So cooking's safe, which is unusual because usually cooking destroys it. The problem is most people, according to the WHO and the Food and Agriculture Organization, people only get between five and 25% of the K2 they need. While most people can get the K1 they need in their diet, the K2, which provides the benefits we talk about, people are usually short on getting by a significant factor. So the benefits we talked about specifically have been studied from vitamin K2, MK7. So that's what we want to get. So if the average person is only getting between 5 and 25% of the vitamin K2, MK7, may, might want to supplement. There's a ton of supplements on the market right now. They're not expensive. And you could see they're 100 micrograms, 90 micrograms, 120 micrograms. That's a reasonable dosage. And this actually complements your vitamin D and prevents your vitamin D from potentially putting a lot of that calcium into your arteries and your vessels. So the studies are very promising and the supplements are not all that expensive. So here's the interactions with vitamin K where you wanna be careful is blood thinners like warfarin. If you're on warfarin, don't take too much vitamin K unless your doctor told you because this could ruin the effectiveness of warfarin, so be careful. Warfarin patients are known to have calcified vessels. Same with unhealthy or diabetic patients that I see. They have calcified vessels in their feet, in their legs. So maybe this is poor K2 in the diet because with warfarin, this is inhibited and purposely limited. This could make a lot of sense now. Antibiotics, specifically the cephalosporins. These antibiotics could interact with vitamin K. So you always want to check with your doctor if you supplement vitamin K. Bile suppression medication like Orlistat, that could do it. Or if you had a bile issues or your gallbladder removed, for example, you want to check with your doctor about your vitamin K supplementation. So let's get into the important studies. So here's what studies show regarding vitamin K. In a study performed in Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, they showed that increased vitamin K correlated with increased bone density and decreased vitamin K obviously showed decreased bone density. Another study showed that high vitamin K combined with high calcium and high vitamin D led to less bone fractures. But if you're missing that vitamin K, the fractures went up. 
There have also been tests done on heart studies, specifically the aorta and calcification with vitamin K2. The studies are very promising. They're just very new. So it's hard to make a definitive recommendation right now, but the results are very, very promising. And vitamin K is related to a compound called osteocalcin. Behind collagen in your bone, osteocalcin is the second most important. Osteocalcin can help with blood glucose levels. It can help with increasing your testosterone if you're a male. It can help with muscle strength, and osteocalcin can help with cognition. This is what the studies show that vitamin K2 does specifically. And it's important to remember that vitamin K2 MK7 is the most bioactive compound. What it does specifically is it produces a chemical process called gamma carboxylation of glutamic acid residues on two proteins, matrix GLA protein and osteocalcin. So it basically can be an on-off switch. And what these two molecules do is matrix GLA protein reduces the calcium in the blood vessels and osteocalcin increases calcium in the bone. So this leads to two processes, such as less calcium in the blood vessels and the heart specifically, and stronger bones. But as we mentioned, it does all those extra things because osteocalcin can help with testosterone, it can help with bone and more. These are very beneficial outcomes. So they did another study where people taking vitamin D and vitamin K, they tested for aortic calcification. While this was thought to decrease aortic calcification, it wasn't too conclusive. There is a general consensus that vitamin K is important in preventing osteoporosis. So if you're one of the deficient people, vitamin K can definitely help with that. The next step is vitamin D is very critical in raising your calcium levels in your blood to ensure that it can be used for your bone and other functions. And the problem is if you take too much vitamin D, you could get toxicity. But newer studies are suggesting now that if you combine vitamin K2 with vitamin D3, you can take higher levels of D3, thus putting more of that D3 into the bone. So it uses more of the good effects of vitamin D without that toxicity. And we've already talked about how K2 can take that calcium and make better use of it to get it into the bone. Thus, it doesn't overdose in your bloodstream. And in a cruel twist of fate, calcium is actually horrible for you to take. Vitamin D is what raises calcium in your blood, and K2 is what puts that calcium into bone and prevents it from getting into your blood vessels. And we're gonna talk about how both vitamin D and how K2 are needed to activate molecules such as osteocalcin and matrix GLA protein to do this. So some studies actually show now that it's more beneficial not to take calcium and to just take vitamin D3 and to take K2. The studies are strongly starting to lean in that direction. A condition I deal with a lot is called Monkenberg sclerosis. This is calcification of the blood vessels heading down to the feet. I see this a lot in diabetics. But if these people were on vitamin K2, how much of this could have been prevented? This is very interesting to me. If you are a vegan or have a lactose intolerance or are severely malnourished, you may need to take a calcium supplement, but for the average person, you might not need to. This also includes steroid supplements, stuff like that that could prevent absorption. So check with your doctor if worried. So vitamin D takes up calcium into the bloodstream and puts it into the bone, whereas K2 specializes more on getting it into that bone where it needs to go. The case is being made online that you can take higher levels, like multiple thousands, and not get overdoses. And you know, some of the studies are supporting this. It's not overly conclusive, but really, if MK7 is low cost and it does seem to be showing very promising results early on, this does seem to be the way the science is headed. You can come see a doctor like me and get your blood levels done because it is possible to overdose with extreme amounts. That seems to be the debate down in the comments is 
people either say, hey, you should be taking 10,000 plus units per day, and then there's other people saying, hey, I get like diarrhea, headaches, and vomiting if I take it. So there's no perfect answer, but getting those tests can sometimes be very beneficial for people. Now, the funny part is there's also magnesium that's part of this whole vitamin D3 and K2 equation. So there's a lot of supplements now that combine K2, G3, magnesium, all of it together, and I'll show you why. Vitamin D needs magnesium. And the problem is a lot of people are vitamin D deficient and a lot of people are magnesium deficient. So if like one third plus of the world is vitamin D deficient, in some countries it's like 70 plus, and one third of the world is magnesium deficient, there's no real studies correlating who's got magnesium, who's got vitamin D in large population studies. The more you need to make vitamin D, the more magnesium you use up and the more magnesium you're deficient. So the recommendations now don't include taking calcium, but instead magnesium, vitamin D3, and K2. Personally, I take 5,000 units of vitamin D. I take a 200 milligram tab of magnesium and I take 100 micrograms of vitamin K2. And for me, that worked well. I get my measurements checked for vitamin D, especially because there is danger, especially magnesium. If you have kidney issues, you could build up too much of that magnesium. Vitamin D, there is vitamin D toxicity possible. And for vitamin K2, because this is newer and because people are probably deficient, there is no real test that I know of to test vitamin K2. In the studies, they measure the carboxylation rate of matrix GLA and osteocalcin, not the actual vitamin K2 blood levels. So people in the comments on these videos seem to be taking really high amounts. And I was always worried because 2,000 international units per day is the maximum recommended. But in this study that I just listed, the people who overdosed were taking millions, at least 50,000 per day. Some people are taking 600,000 IU injections. And over a four to eight week period, these are the only people that really developed toxicity. And it was rare. So their levels were over 150, over 1,000 nanograms per milliliter in some cases. But it was much more rare than I thought. So just don't go astronomical. The recommendations are still the recommendations, which are like 2,000 units max per day. But maybe vitamin K2 helps with that. Maybe it doesn't. The studies are just not that clear. But they are trending towards being able to take more. Studies show that taking between 90 micrograms to 360 micrograms is very beneficial in the studies. And I'm talking like maybe 100 micrograms, but always check with your doctor if you're concerned. Vitamin D, magnesium, and K2 are very deficient. They're all very beneficial, so many helpful things. And the beauty is they're low cost. We have testing kits below. They're not ours, but resources that I like to use personally. This stuff's not too expensive. You know, that's why we put the links below. You can get like a year's supply for like 30 bucks. So if you're doing it safely, it can be very beneficial for most people. So did that help? Did I miss a couple things? Let us know. We really appreciate your comments. Let us know where you are and if you're getting enough vitamin D. All right, guys, if you want to learn about other vitamins like vitamin D, which is very, very critical, check these videos below. Thank you.